I'm Jeff Payne, the pastor of Beaumont's amazing Christ Community Church. Welcome to today's broadcast, and here I am with today's message. All right. Now maybe you're asking what this has to do with hearing God. I think it's pretty obvious what it has to do with this, but let me tie it together just in case you missed it. Probably, if ever in the history of mankind there was a group of people, think about this, that should have been able to discern the times they were living in. The scripture even says they lived at a time when it was the fullness of times for God to send forth his Savior. They read the scriptures. They, uh, these were people that uh, drew near to the heart of God and heard his voice, supposedly. And that would have been the Jews in first century Palestine. And they were even God's chosen people. They were the people of the book. And they were the people the book was written about. At least their history. They were the people with the book. They had all the prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures. Which is our Old Testament. And to add to their clarity. They were a people who were in bondage to another people group. The Roman Empire. And those kinds of hardships normally drive any people of God into the Word and onto their knees, you would think they would see who Jesus really was. But the consensus of historical reflection on why God's very own chosen people largely rejected Him at His first advent is because their theology regarding you know, who they believed the Messiah was, what he was coming to do, what he would accomplish, who he would be, how he would act, what he would do for them more specifically. That theology, the bedrock of their messianic doctrine was flawed at the core and radically different from the heart of God and what he was going to, and, and intending to do. And we've already noted in this study that hearing God, the voice of God, is more relational than it is pragmatic and, you know, steps and one, two, three. And therefore, because some of us don't pay the price to live in a relationship, it can be easily mistaken. It can often be counterfeited. A flawed theology, if we develop one, creates an atmosphere ripe for rejection. An atmosphere that will dismiss the voice of the one that we most desperately need to hear from. That's what happened to the first century Jews. I don't want it to happen to 21st century Jeff. And you don't want it to happen to you, right? Because listen, if you don't know his character, you can quickly develop a problem with discernment because you aren't able to distinguish his voice from your own desires, from whatever's popular now in pop theology, from flaky ideas that seem to rule, let's put this in, in quotes, Christian airwaves. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, if you have a Bible, we're not going there. I mean, where this is not our passage for today. I don't even think I put it in your program. But it says, listen to this, that the, the, the reason... We're not fighting with flesh and blood, but with powerful spiritual weaponry, with warfare in the heavenlies, is to, listen, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive most of the thoughts, no, every thought to make them obedient to Christ. The reason I wanted that NIV is because I've memorized that where it says we're casting, this is a good one too, what we're doing there is casting down imaginations. Some of us embrace our imagination as if it was a word from God. Don't we? Honestly, we do. And since the ascension, in other words, since Jesus rose back up and was covered by the clouds when he went out of sight, since the ascension of the Lord Jesus, there's probably never been in all of the church history a generation of Christians more ripe for deception and therefore more inept, more clumsy, more ineffective in their walk with God than this one, the one we're living in. Now get your Bibles out. Okay. A lot of people, even Bible students, 
aren't aware that several of God's prophets wrote with some specificity. In other words, you can find some pretty good process in there of how they uh, utilize the process they use to hear from God. In other words, what worked for them. One of the clearest examples is in a little tiny book called Habakkuk. You're going to have to use your table of contents as a minor prophet near the end. The book of Habakkuk, it's really all just three chapters long. And here's what he wrote. I'm going to start in Habakkuk chapter 2. You can read chapter 1, 2, and 3 in 10 minutes or less. But chapter 2, verse 1 says, first of all, he says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on my ramparts, on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Today, I want us to think about this one thing. I challenged you with it last week. The singular key to hearing God that I want to concentrate though on today is the content of that quiet time that I challenge you to have every day this last week past Sunday. The content of the quiet time. Now, the quiet time is a place that's wholly devoted to stilling my own thoughts and emotions because his thoughts are not mine. His ways are not mine. I need to not entertain mine, listen to mine, think about mine, dwell on my problems. You, there's time for that later. You can pray all day without ceasing. But when you have the time where you station yourself on the ramparts, where you're standing watch to hear from God, now, I want my thoughts to be his thoughts, don't you? And I want my ways to be his ways. And, and, and his grace uh, is sufficient so that day by day in my life as I grow, listen, there are more his thoughts today than they were five years ago, certainly than they were 10 or 20 years ago. But I still need to get me out of the way if I'm going to really be open to and receptive to hearing from him. A lot of us read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. How many of y'all had a copy of that and read it at one time? Several of us, right? All over. A great book. It's still available. Uh, by the way, aside from the Bible, that's the best-selling Christian book of all times. Do you remember, those of you that read it, what the title was of the opening chapter? You probably remember the first line, but maybe not the title. So I'm going to start with the first line. The first line in the book, the opening title was, It's Not About You. It seems to be when you turn on most television preaching, and I'm not putting down a specific television preacher because it's just almost all of them. I wonder if that's the way they can generate the income to stay on the air, to say the few good salient points they have to make about the gospel. They've got to mostly make it about you, how your pocketbook can be better off, how you can have more you know, emotional fulfillment and enjoyment about all the touchy-feely things that men preach on on the airways. But the scripture says, and Rick Warren verifies it, and he preach, or, or, or writes it in the book, it it's not about you. As a matter of fact, the chapter title is It All Starts With God. <laughs> you know, this salvation thing, that started with God. This wasn't something we dreamed up and then went to him and see if he wanted to make a deal. Right? It's Listen, he's got your best interest at heart in offering it to begin with. But it's not ultimately about you. It's about him. Psalm 46.10 says... It encourages us, it says, to be still. And that's that in, in the Hebrew, that means to stop striving. It doesn't just mean, you know, try to look like a statue. <laughs> but stop striving, let go, be still, and know. That's experientially knowing, not just head knowledge. Be still and know that I am God, that He's God. And then in Psalm 37, 7, we're called to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. There's a deep inner knowing in our spirits that each of us can experience when we quiet our flesh and our minds. You say, well, how, am I, how can I? I can't quiet my mind. It's just like all it does is think all the time, right? And when I've tried to have a quiet mind, I'm thinking about, I wonder if I left the 
pot on the stove to boil, or I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what's going to happen after school today, or wherever I am in my place of work. It's very, very hard to quiet our minds. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I urge you, I beg you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable standard of worship, which is your reasonable service to God as worship. And then he says, and be not conformed to the standards of this world, but be transformed by what? Renewing of your mind. There's something about the mind that God says is out of control, that runs rampant, that has its, that, that has its own will and its own way, that wants to stand opposed and in opposition to God, that we've got to figure out how to control and tame and harness so that it can be useful for God's kingdom and for him to speak to us. Well, I don't have any ramparts to station myself against. Do you? I don't even know for sure what a rampart is today. But perhaps I have a chair in a quiet corner of some room or even a bed. If your back doesn't bother you, you can sit on a bed. I can't, but some people can. And once I'm there, and once you're there, I can turn off the telephone, not, not just, I'm not, not going to answer it. Oh, Lord, I'm just going to see who it was, right? And turn off the telephone, maybe not even have it with you. And then I start loving God, and we, we sang some songs like this this morning, not through boisterous, jumpy, this is how I do it, okay? I'm trying to tell you how to still, still your mind. I start worshiping God through some quiet, still, worshipful songs. I love the old song from some edition of the Broadman hymnal called In the Garden. It says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. It talks about a person's quiet time. That whole song is about the quiet time. And the chorus says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joys we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I just start, and you can start, if you want to quiet your mind, you really can't. It's going to think about something, so think on Him. And one of the things I try to do in my quiet time is I try not to think, I point there because, you know, we think of Him as being up there. He's not, but how could He be? You know the planet's a globe, right? I mean, we live on a circle. So He's down there for the people who are pointing in the other part of the world. But anyway, wherever God is, listen, He's mostly with me and you. And if we're going to really concentrate on Him in quiet time, we remember He's here. He lives in those of us that know. The Spirit says, I mean, God, the Word says that His Spirit quickens our mortal spirit. That there is an interchange that happens. And when I release and let Him reveal Himself through me, He can bless and I can serve Him by serving others. But also there's that time when I, I don't realize when I speak to Him, somebody said, my prayers never get above the ceiling. That's okay, He lives in you, honey. <laughs> you don't have to get above the ceiling. If you've received him, he's right here. And so I try to think of that. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 3, Elisha needed a word from the Lord. So he said, bring me a minstrel. That word minstrel just means musician. And then the minstrel played and the Lord spoke. So I sing worship songs. I stand, I, I sing him like he's right here, face to face with me. I just sing to him. And here's what's cool. You know, when your kids do that, you think it's wonderful. No matter what they're singing, right? It doesn't even matter if it's a worship song. They're your kid, and they're going to sing for you. And it's an audience of one, but it's a, the most appreciative audience they could ever have. And he's that way. He's your dad. And he's so appreciative. And so you don't need to feel weird at all. If someone can make it a quiet time, find a place that other people don't walk in if you don't sing well or you don't think you do or you think it sounds weird to others, it probably may, maybe it would. But he won't think it is. He loves it. I heard somebody say about quiet time, they said, you know, I, they were, I think it was James Robinson that said somebody came to him and said, I didn't get anything out of that quiet time this morning. 
I think I've got to change it up. Something's got to be different. You know, I'm doing what it seems like Habakkuk did and what Jesus did and what it's, I think the Bible teaches, but I didn't get anything out of that this morning. And James said, well, he still did. He was glad you showed up. And that's true, isn't it? Amen. So I sing that worship song. And, uh, and then the prophet said also in Habakkuk, I will look to see what he will say to me. Now, look is, you know, using a, it's, it's a term, it's a phrase, and he doesn't really look. I mean, it's not like God's going to write it, although I've been in a situation where he did, not to me, but to someone else. I'm going to share that at the end of, of the, the day, but, I mean, of this message. But most of the time when I say I'm going to look to see, when I say, listen, if I say I'm going to look into something, I mean, I'm going to examine it carefully. I'm going to really try to discern. I'm going to find out what the truth is, right? So to receive the pure word of God, it's very important. My heart is properly focused that I become still because my focus can be the source of an intuitive kind of flow. We'll talk about sometimes it can't, but most of the time, if I have him living in me, my heart can be that focus. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 2 says that he fixes his eyes on Jesus, who is the instigator or the author and the perfecter of our faith. He doesn't just give it to you. He stays with you through it, in the battle, throughout the day, whatever the conflict, whatever you're facing. He's the perfecter of it, not just the author of it. So the first thing, if you're writing things down, is be still and focused. Number one, be still and focused. Be still alone with God, just focused on Him. And in Habakkuk chapter 2, the prophet says that's what he's going to do. Then after committing to that task, the Lord Himself speaks to Habakkuk and He tells him something uh, that I encourage you to do this past week. He says, listen to what the Lord says, okay? Listen to what He says. It says in verse 2, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. So number one, be still and focus. Number two, take notes. I know this isn't rocket science. It's not earth shattering and you've heard all this before. But it's life changing. Be still and focused. And then think, now listen, what if God spoke to me? If he spoke, could I catch it on my iPhone? No, I don't even have it with me. But if he spoke, could I record it on my memo? No. I wouldn't hear it. So if he speaks, what's the best way to remember it? He gave us something called the Word of God that's written. He wants us to write it. Habakkuk said, I'm going to make it plain on tablets. Think about it. If at any moment during my focused, undistracted time with God, even if it's just seven minutes, if at any moment... At any time, minute, he could speak to me. Shouldn't I consider that word that may come to me to be the most important thing I'm going to hear that day? <laughs> I remember I met Governor Henry Bellman of the state of Oklahoma. My sister still has my picture. You know, she's the family historian. She's got my picture with Governor Bellman, all three of us kids there with the governor. I'm the little short stuff on the end. And I'll, I'll remember that, probably till I die, unless I get dementia. I'll remember that I went into the governor's office and met the governor and had my picture made with the governor. Then when uh, George W. Bush was running for president, he came to Beaumont. And I met George W. Bush. Now, did you know if you went to George W. Bush, though, and said, hey, have you met Jeff Payne? He won't remember. But I remember. And when I meet with God, <laughs> the great thing is he remembers. And if I'll write it down, I'll remember. If I'm taking notes at some business meeting I have or in a school classroom, uh, but not in my quiet time, then I've already spoken volumes about not only what I expect to happen in my quiet time, but how important this relationship is that I'm trying to foster and nurture with the Father. So it's really, really important that I'm still and focused and that I take notes. Now, there's only three points, so I'm, ne I'm, I'm nearly there. 
How many of you have continued to see this is stuff you already know, right? Raise your hand if you already know all this. It's okay. Raise your hand. I hope you all do. Why isn't it a game changer? Why isn't it life altering? Why doesn't it lead to major breakthroughs since we already know it? Let's be honest, because we don't do enough of it. Right? When you take these principles that you already know and you move from knowing and talking about them and telling other people that you highly recommend they do it, right? And you move into faithfully, regularly practicing them like it matters, like you need to hear from God more than you do air, food, and water, like you're going to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, then that's a game changer. That's when it really does matter. Chapter 2 in the book of Habakkuk, it's very small. We've almost read it all. You should read it later. But chapter 3 doesn't even really specific name the next part of the process. doesn't specifically name it, but it's very telling. Have you ever heard someone pray that you said, oh my gosh, they've been with God. And when you hear them pray, you feel like you're undone and you check and see if your fly is all zipped up and you just feel like nothing's quite right because spiritually, I'm saying, you feel, compared to them, like you don't got it going on. Have you heard anyone pray like that, right? And I'm not talking about the these and thous. <laughs> Cindy taught on prayer last Wednesday night at Starcrest and she's like, just talk to God. He knows how you really talk, <laughs> right? He knows you're like, oh, that was Timon or whatever. That's not you. Right? You get to chapter 3 in Habakkuk. The prophet starts worshiping the Lord and he starts praying to God. But it's not the process of that worship that struck me as important. As a matter of fact, that can take several myriad different processes. The thing I'm most impressed with, impressed with is the content of Habakkuk's worship. The content of that worship demonstrates that Habakkuk has been paying strong attention in Sunday school and in men's group and Wednesday night. And he doesn't come to the women's thing. But anyway, he's been paying strong attention. But the women should. Not only does he know God, but he knows God's word and he knows about God. And if someone else would speak to him, he would be able to differentiate, differentiate, to, to determine, to distinguish the difference because he's been in the word of God to where it's emblazoned on his spirit. To be honest, I'm pretty sure that you can't know God without knowing about God, not the way you really want to or should. You really can't have one without the other. Not in a meaningful way that makes a tangible difference. Causes you to be a message receiver and a Christ a sharer, not just a receiver, right? That's the prayer we overhear in the last chapter of the book of Habakkuk. Now the quickest, most reliable way to get that kind of level of detailed information about God is to involve yourself in a comprehensive and detailed study of the Word of God, and everyone here should be doing that for a lifetime. It's the one book you can't say, like, like say they, uh, somebody recommends um, some other book. You say, well, I've read that. That's never true of the Bible, right? You go, yeah, I read that once. But every time you read it, Especially if you'll take it in small portions and chunks and you'll pull out commentaries and systematic theologies and different uh, Greek or Hebrew study helps. And every time you'll really study the Word of God, you'll find out uh, how little you really know. No matter how many times you've read it. You can read Huck Finn one time, you got it. But you'll read the Bible the rest of your life. Because it's living. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing as far as the vision of soul and spirit, both joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It's alive. No wonder it keeps speaking. So the last thing, be still in focus. Secondly, take notes. Third, compare with the word of God. Compare it with the word. Whatever you believe you've heard, 
compare it with the word. Now, in closing, are you familiar, I know some people are, but, but how many of you are familiar, let's put it that way, with the term cognitive dissonance? Do you know what that is? All right. Yeah, obviously Cindy's a psychologist, but cognitive dissonance, it's defined as the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude changes. A lot of people are skeptical, even Christians, that we can really hear from God in a way that's tangible and makes a difference. But certainly skeptics who often don't even believe there is a God, they think anyone that thinks you're hearing from God is afflicted sooner or later with a severe case of cognitive dissonance because, in other words, you're going to realize sooner or later if you're thinking rationally, which they don't think we do anyway, but you're going to realize sooner or later, they think, if you're thinking rationally, that you're just talking to yourself. How many of y'all, be honest, there should be every hand, have thought that about yourself at times. Is this God or am I just talking to myself? Raise your hand. I have. Man, the people that didn't raise their hand, you need to be doing the speaking. Now, of course, there is really such a thing as cognitive dissonance, and we're all afflicted by it to varying degrees. I would say, especially the skeptics, by the way, people that don't believe in God, you really got to practice it. A common feature of this is that you tend to remember things that reinforce your worldview, and you whitewash or you put things out of your mind, the things that don't. You have to do that. You have to practice confirmation bias, because otherwise you can't keep your worldview intact unless your worldview is true. Unless it's accurate. But confirmation bias, the ability to do that, has to go hand in hand with cognitive dissonance so the worldviews can stay intact. So, for example, here's how it's practiced sometimes. When, let's talk about hearing God. When you're hearing from God and you hear something and you know you've heard it, you share it with your friends and they rejoice with you and they say, wow, isn't that wonderful. Now, some of them, they say, wow, isn't that wonderful. But inside they're thinking, you can't hear God. Who do you think you are? Right? But they rejoice with you, and then you find out later it's confirmed, and you go, wow, thank you, Jesus, right? Praise God, I really heard God did this thing he told me about, and I knew it ahead of time. Wow, isn't he wonderful? But then you hear something else you think is from God that turns out to be completely in error. And so here's how we practice cognitive dissonance. We say, well, after all, it's hard to hear from God. I'm not going to do it perfect, right? I mean, everybody misses. But praise God, I know that other time I heard him. And skeptics would say, and they would use that and rub it in your face if you let them, they would say, no, you didn't hear him either time. You just got what? Lucky. You just got lucky. The skeptics say, to see that? You're living in a fairy tale. Except... There are some times in some ways that God is going to speak to you if you'll make time for him and develop this process in your life that are beyond human thinking. So I couldn't have spoken them to myself. I couldn't have even known about them. I couldn't have thought them for myself. I wouldn't have even thought them, even if I wanted to. If you spend enough time with God... Learning to discern his will, learning to hear his voice, he's going to speak to you over the course of time like that many times throughout your life. Not only to deliver the word you might need for that moment, but also the faith you need to serve him for a lifetime. He's going to do that. He's done that with many of you. Let me give you a couple of examples. I got about a dozen in 57 plus years of living, okay? Only about a dozen. This doesn't happen often, but when it happens, there's no way it could be confirmation bias or cognitive dissonance or the combination thereof. It has to be God. For example, Kathleen and I were young, and, and, and we, we had our first date, January the 19th of 1979. I think I was 18. Yeah, I was. And she was 19 years old. 
And that summer, we were so in love, we were going to go both work, and we did, a summer Christian conference center in Glorieta, New Mexico, just uh, 20 miles outside of Santa Fe. But neither of us had ever driven that kind of distance before, right? I mean, we were both Okies at the time, and uh, she's not from Oklahoma, but that's where she learned to drive, and she tooled around in her little ridiculous Volkswagen bug, and now she's got a beautiful Volkswagen bug, but back then she had one that was wouldn't even uh, defrost the, the, the windshield. But anyway, and, and so she, we're going to meet up, and we don't know what we're talking about. I grew up in a small town. Kathy grows up in a small town. We figure Amarillo, Texas, we know all towns have one McDonald's. So we say, let's meet up at McDonald's. You're coming from wherever she was coming from, and I'm coming from Ada, Oklahoma, and we'll meet in Amarillo at McDonald's. <laughs> there aren't any cell phones. You know how many McDonald's are in Amarillo, Texas? <laughs> a number of them. <laughs> and I don't remember how many at that time. But we get to Amarillo, and Terry Ballard, my buddy, is going to go for the summer with it. He's driving, and, and Kathy's with some lady she's going to work with there, a genie or something. But anyway, she's with somebody. And, and, uh, <laughs> and Terry says, well, which McDonald's are we going to? I said, well, there's only one. It's a McDonald's. How many can there be? And he said, I've passed three so far. I go, we're in trouble. We don't, how can we call anybody? There's no cell. What are we going to do? We've got to all get together and keep driving because we're supposed to check in for our first assignment, our day of work. And what are we going to do? And Terry said, well, God knows which McDonald's she'll stop at. I said, sure he does, but we don't. And Terry just says, well, this is one of those moments I think God would probably provide if we trust him. And I think, you're crazy, but I don't say it. I say, amen, brother. And we pray. And Terry starts driving, and he says, God said, turn left. I said, okay. God said, turn right. Yeah. I'm like, man, how am I going to brace him for this huge letdown in his faith we're about to encounter when God stops telling him which way to turn and we admit we're lost in Amarillo, Texas. But instead, God guided him every step and we pulled into the parking lot and she had just pulled in about a minute or two before us. And we all met up, got in the car, and went to Glorietta. Now, you can call that a quinky dink. There's no way it could be. Let me give you another example. And I've shared this one before. This one was so powerful that I've never forgotten that I was in a John Wimber meeting. It really wasn't. It was a James Robinson meeting. But John Wimber was speaking. He's gone on to be with the Lord a decade or more ago. And John is giving his testimony of how he learned to share his faith by going with a brother door to door. By the way, we're really seriously considering taking some men out. And women can go with us. And especially, even if you don't feel like this is your calling, you can go and pray for us. All right? But we're really considering, we talked about it this morning in, one, in, our, in men's class, going out and taking a PA system and setting up and just sharing with people who are waiting for buses, among other places, here in Beaumont. Well, John Weaver went door to door sharing his faith and with this mentor of his. And he was telling the story and it was quite compelling, very gripping, but then God interrupted him. And this is that time I told you about. He wrote something. And John said, Dead God, and I know I'm supposed to share my testimony, but I can't disobey God. I mean, I know you've asked me to share my testimony. That's why you think I'm here. Ostensibly, that's why I'm here. But God said something different because ever since we've walked in this room, I've seen a banner in the back of the room. There's 8,000 people. It's the Tarrant County Convention Center. So he's seen a banner behind the crowd that says 13 pregnant problems. 13 pregnant problems. He said this is not common. In fact, it's very rare. But he said it's happened often enough, I'm sure. That in this crowd of over 8,000 people, God knows there are 13 women who are now with child and you're worried because the doctors told you there's a problem and you may not take it to term. He said, if this is God, there won't be 10 and we'll have to beg three more to join them. Think about this. There won't be 14 and we'll have to ask one to sit down. 
If this is God, since he has the hair on our head numbered, with me that's easier now than it used to be. Some of you too. He said he knows how many women fit that bill in this room. And he's concerned enough. He stopped everything just to address it. And they stood. Thirteen of them. And they walked to the front. And they didn't embarrass them. They didn't pray over them and touch their wombs and all those kinds of things that would have been maybe a little odd. But they sent them back with loving women, same sex, to a back room and they prayed for those women. Now here's what I know. There is no way to fake that. Because you didn't have 14 and beg one to sit down or 10 and beg for three more to come. He said, if that's you, just walk forward. They walked forward, he said, just so the crowd will know. And they can have their faith increased. Let's count them. 11, 12, 13. You still remember the video that we played? Kick off the message. You might not be able to, but the odds are with you. The odds are in your favor that you can probably get through life, especially in this country, you know, if you have marketable skills, you're pretty good at some job, you invest wisely, you're conservative, uh, you, 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 you uh, uh, spend less than you make <laughs> and do that for a long time, you stay out of dark alleys, you enjoy average health, you can get through your life without ever really hearing much from God. You can probably go through the motions of being a follower and not suffer very much in many tangible ways. And you can probably fool everybody you go to church with. And all of us would say, yeah, man, they have a great, intimate, close fellowship with God. But the person who does that isn't really living. According to Scripture, you're just alive. Because you and I were designed by God, tailor-made, to fellowship with Him. And anything other than that, if I do anything other than that, I'm doing less than that. Far less than that. He's pre preeminent. That's a hard word to say. He's everything. He's enough. So why on earth would someone who's received him fail to embrace him, to walk with him, to talk with him? I love the letter I got this week. I haven't received a lot of communication from Jeff Tarbox, but he writes quite regularly. And this one he wrote to me. And I thought, this is so good. I have to share it with you. Jeff is in prison, but he's more free than many of you. He's more free than many of your friends and family, more free than many people you know. And he says in here, I'm going to start someplace. He says, here are a few things God has revealed to me through reading his word, prayer, and meditation. He says, if you recall, I said that God told me he was serving an eviction notice in my life. That the entity which had set up shop within my soul and convinced me these many years that his name was Jeff, not this Jeff, but his name is Jeff, that that entity was an imposter. He also told me that he was doing so because he intended to take up residence there himself. First, he said, I want you to know, I know now that this was the moment of rebirth for me, that the Holy Spirit began to indwell me then. And then he goes on and teaches me some about some Greek and some, you know, it's just neat stuff, strong stuff. But you know what impresses me? We talked about it last week and in the letter came this week. The most clearest time for many of us that we hear from God is when the first time that we hear from him, whenever that is. Jeff heard God say, now this is a pretty word, this isn't just an impression, this isn't my spirit got a peace, 
this isn't, I, you know, I was struggling with this issue and now I felt like, okay, I'm in sync with God. It wasn't a feeling. It was, listen, these are pretty specific terms. I'm serving an eviction notice. The entity you think is you is dead, is dying, because I'm going to come live my life through you. And God even knew where it would be. What prison is he in? Do you know how long that is? Isn't that something? It's in Palestine. In Palestine. God knew that. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. How does he do that? I know how he is and who he is because I've spent time with him in his word. And then when he speaks to me, I'm able to respond. And my spirit bears witness with his spirit that this is him. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. We'll talk more about this next week, but very, very importantly, some of the things God will share with you in your quiet time seem just as earth-shaking as this message, which is to say not at all. He'll tell you things that are common sense sometimes. He'll say things that you should know if you're a believer. He'll reemphasize and entertain points that you say, well, yeah, I've, I've known that since I was in Sunday school as a child. And the point is this. When he tells me I am his own, how much more intricate, involved, detailed, exciting do you need than for God to tell you through Christ, you and I are like this, I'm your own. It doesn't always have to be some new, novel, clever thing you've never heard before. In fact, it rarely will be. Because my problem is not that I need to hear something new and novel and clever. But that I need to really internalize, feel it deep within me and respond accordingly that he walks with me and he talks with me and tells me I'm his own. Would you bow your heads?